Brainstorm in the Golden Hour, inspired by a true story by Margaret Bard. The Golden Hour has two meanings. In film, the Golden Hour is the last hour of sunlight during the day, the perfect light for filming. When the shadows are softer, the colors are blurred and everything looks golden. In medicine, the Golden Hour is the first 60 minutes following a traumatic injury. The chances of survival and recovery are greatest if the injured gets to a hospital for treatment within that hour. Fade in. Clear blue sky, baking sun. Whirring sound of a helicopter above. The helicopter hovers for a beat, then drops straight down, landing in the middle of the street. Two paramedics jump out, the helicopter's propeller still whirling in the background. The paramedics quickly attach an IV and a BP cuff to the man lying on a gurney. They load the gurney into the helicopter. The bystanders below watch, silent, as the helicopter lifts straight up off the ground and disappears into the blue sky. Chapter 1. The Inciting Incident. July 16, 2003, Santa Monica Farmer's Market. We're going to meet up at the market to buy apricots. We both love them and have been arguing over which are the best. I love the large, intensely juicy Helenas. My husband prefers the small, flavorful Blenheims. If you saw us together, you'd understand the significance of this. It's a gorgeous day, so I decide to walk to the market. It's a long walk, maybe two miles. The market is just a few blocks from the ocean. As you get closer, you can see the glittering horizon bright sun, seemingly endless sea, which goes all the way to China, as we used to say when we were kids. Palm trees rise into the azure sky. A soft breeze blows across the sand. Paradise. Halfway to the market, more than halfway, I realize that the black shirt I tied loosely around my waist has fallen off. It's not an expensive shirt, but I like it, and it goes well with my tank top and red jeans. I turn and head back. I'm almost all the way home when I find the shirt lying crumpled in the middle of the street. I pick it up and tie it around my waist again. For a moment, I'm torn. I'm so close to home now. Maybe I should just skip the market? What if I had? Why didn't I? What would have happened next? What if? What if? I ask myself that over and over. It's part of my job. Our job. Virtually every book, every play, every screenplay can be boiled down to three questions. What if, why, do you want to know what happens next? My husband and I are screenwriters. We're a creative team, partners in life and in work. We're both obsessed with, driven by, the mystery of what happens next. That's why I can't go home just yet. We have an assignment to write a film adaptation of a best-selling novel. My husband is right now writing a killer of a scene involving a death row prisoner who escapes and hijacks a helicopter to make his getaway across the border from the U.S. to Canada, where there's no death penalty. The helicopter is a crucial turning point for the story. The helicopter scene is one he wants to write on his own. We usually write everything together, but this he has claimed as his. The Santa Monica Farmer's Market is packed with vendors and shoppers. The market is in the heart of trendy boutiques and celebrity restaurants, but it attracts rich and poor alike. Families do their weekly shopping. Nannies and grannies pushing babies in strollers. Paralegals and personal assistants jostling to buy something fresh on their lunch hour. They're sipping iced tea, sampling organic cheese and grapes, a slice of peach, a wedge of orange. The farm fresh produce is displayed like highly polished gems in a recently unearthed treasure chest. Heirloom tomatoes, purple, yellow, orange, all oddly shaped, prehistorically beautiful. Giant, perfect strawberries, gleaming red, vibrantly striped watermelon. A quartet is playing freeform jazz. It's a gentle wave of color and sound. I wander through the crowd, blissful, unthinking. It's a colorful, cacophonous blur. I'm so happy to be here. Hypnotized by the mellow feel, I'm mostly just looking. I don't buy much, except for apricots. I do buy apricots. Margaret! 
I turn and see my husband striding across the market, tall, strong, a mane of dark hair, dark eyes full of intensity. He's wearing linen pants and a Hawaiian print shirt, the uniform of the day for a rider. He walks toward me like he owns the world, present, alive. Did you finish the scene, I ask? He grins. Yeah, it's fun. Needs work, though. I nod. He's a perfectionist. Even after it's screened, he'll still think it needs work. Did you add the helicopter, I ask? Oh, yeah, it's great. They load him into the helicopter, and it just lifts right off from the roof of the prison up into the sky. It's pretty dramatic. Sounds good. Did you walk all the way down here? No, I brought the car. I'm parked in Santa Monica Place. I didn't want to take a chance on missing you. Suddenly, he sweeps me into his arms and gives me a kiss. Other shoppers turn and smile. Honeymooners? Nah, at this point, we've been married almost 30 years. But my husband likes dramatic gestures. He carefully inspects the apricots I've bought. Hmm, they're nice, fresh, but they're not Blenheims, he says. He looks around. There's only one stall that sells those, and it has a crowd in front of it. The sun is now blazingly hot, and he senses I'm ready to get out of here. Look, why don't you head back to the car, he suggests. I'll grab the Blenheims and catch up with you, okay? I'll be right behind you. I nod. Fine with me. I turn and step up on the curb. The market is in the middle of the street. The street is supposed to be blocked off. I get maybe eight feet when I hear, Whoosh, whoosh, wham, blam! From out of nowhere, a 1992 Burgundy Buick LeSabre smashes into the flimsy wooden sawhorses at the entrance to the market and roars at 60 miles an hour straight through the crowd of vendors and shoppers. There are screams and shouts. Woomph! Bam! The Buick slams into a homeless man. The man is thrown 15 feet into the air, a blur of tattered clothes and stringy beard, light as a feather, landing, blam, on the hood of the car, which continues straight ahead, hurling victims into the air, white fruit stall canopies flying from side to side, tent poles shooting across the sky like javelins. A young professional woman, who has stepped into the doorway of a building, cell phone glued to her ear, turns to see the speeding red Buick smash into her seven-month-old son in his blue baby carriage, pushed by the baby's grandmother. The grandmother rolls over on the ground. The baby carriage is tossed up into the clear sky. Boom, boom, boom. That's the sound of bodies bouncing off the hood of the car as it hits victim after victim. A sweet-faced Mexican woman. Huge brown eyes, clutching fresh spinach. A strikingly beautiful woman, long, shiny, dark hair, a light in her eyes. Faded, recycled cloth bag on her arm, her fingers closing around a box of strawberries. An old woman, her head covered against the sun, holding fresh basil, tomatoes, and cucumbers. For what? Maybe a salad for Shabbat? A balding elderly man, eyes narrowing, possessively clutching the hand of his beloved wife. A young Asian couple. They look hip, artsy, like New York, not L.A. Inside the Buick is a white-haired old man in his 80s, tight-lipped, his hands gripping the steering wheel as he stares straight ahead. There are screams and shouts from the crowd, Get that guy! Stop him! But the car doesn't slow. A young mother, seeing the car barreling toward her, tightens her grip on a stroller holding a small baby. With the other hand, she tugs frantically on the arm of her round-faced, curly-haired three-year-old daughter, but the car's bumper catches the little girl and carries her off. The mother's hand reaches out after her daughter, her fist opening and closing, grasping at the air. Pradu stands collapsing, tables knocked to the ground, pinning vendors underneath. People are trying to run, tent poles slamming them onto the concrete. Boxes of fruit and vegetables sail through the air and smash into bloody pulp. Tomatoes, peaches, melons, berries. People are pushing and shoving to get out of the way. An angry mob is chasing after the car. The Buick accelerates, heading straight for Pacific Palisades Park and the sheer cliff drop to the Pacific Ocean. The car bangs hard as it hits the dip, but it keeps going on until there's a sickening crunch. What finally stops the Buick is the body of a woman trapped beneath its wheels. The mob catches up stops and stares at the gory sight. The Buick is a twisted, tangled mess. 
Blood is splattered across the windshield. A shoe is perched on the roof of the car. An apple core. What look to be pomegranate seeds are strewn everywhere. Moving closer, it becomes clear that the seeds are teeth. Human teeth from the people who have been hit. The body of a man is splayed across the hood of the car. He's stiff. Dead. The woman, pinned underneath the car, stirs. She's still alive. Her mouth is opening and closing silently, helplessly. Her neck is twisted at an odd angle. Inside the car, the white-haired old man slumps, stunned. His airbag exploded in front of him. The horn is now blasting away. The mob drags the old man out of the car. He looks frozen, in shock. A group of men struggle to lift the car off the woman pinned beneath. The street looks like a war zone. It's as if a bomb exploded, creating a scene of chaos, carnage, and destruction. Bodies everywhere. People are crying, bleeding. Others are just very, very still. A young man in military uniform cradles a small child in his arms, trying to stop the bleeding. The young Asian couple are sprawled next to each other. Near them, a woman in a pool of blood and strawberries. A tall, dark man is lying on his back on the ground next to a river of apricots. His small, blonde wife leans over him. His eyes are open, glazed, unseeing. He looks dead. My husband. Oh, God. I reach out to him. Don't leave me. Please, stay with me. On July 16, 2003, my husband, Bartley Bard, was injured in the Santa Monica Farmer's Market crash. I didn't see everything that happened. I didn't see it all because I was running away. I thought it was a terrorist attack. After 9-11, everyone said L.A. would be hit next. I heard the unearthly screams, the thud of bodies hitting the car. I saw the homeless man and the baby flying through the air. I turned and ran. I assumed that my husband would be right behind me. I was wrong. When I turn back, I don't see Bartley. He's not with me. Frantic, I push my way through the crowd. Cell phones are out. Everyone's calling 911. There's been an accident. Some crazy old guy came out of nowhere. Paramedics on the way. When I find him, my heart stops. He's on the ground. He's lying in a pool of liquid, surrounded by smashed fruit. The street is now stained red with a mix of blood and watermelon juice. He's completely still. His eyes are open. But there's nothing in them. No expression at all. My heart slams up against my chest. Dizzy with fear, I touch his cheek. I put my face next to his. I shake him. I slap him. I do everything you're not supposed to do. His eyes swim back into consciousness. He looks at me, dazed, confused. He doesn't speak, but I can see he wants to know. What happened? There's been an accident, I tell him. I know that now. Some crazy old man. He looks at me with hazy eyes. Does he recognize me? He groans, tries to move. No, no, lie still. We have to wait for... I'm not sure what. My mind is racing. He doesn't look injured. No, wait, oh God, there's blood on his ears and his eyes, those blank eyes. He tries to move again. No, you have to stay still. I take off my black shirt and put it under his head to cushion it. I'm here. I'm right here. It's okay. You're going to be okay. I have no idea if that's true, but it's what people say. It's what we all say, as if we've been programmed to say it. But his eyes are glazing over again. He's not hearing me. I grab his hand. I love you, baby. Stay with me, please. But he's already drifting back into unconsciousness. Oh, God. It seems to take forever for the paramedics to arrive. There's an eerie silence. Around us, there are victims lying on the ground. Some are already dead, others dying, moaning, twitching. Their loved ones are crouched next to them, helpless. Strangers are weeping uncontrollably. We, the loved ones, are not crying. We're numb. We're waiting. A kind tourist couple stay with me and try to help. 
Her accents sound vaguely British. I don't know, maybe Australian. They hold a newspaper, the Independent, over Bartley's head, shielding him from the sun. It's July 16, the height of summer, midday, blazingly hot. I feel a drop of something on my chest. Then another. I look up. Suddenly the heavens open and it pours rain. A freak occurrence in Southern California. We stand there in silence, amazed, watching water splash down onto my injured, unconscious husband. Then, just as suddenly, the rain stops. A weird man, stringy hair, skeletal face that looks like a Halloween mask, wearing a long black coat, is walking among those lying on the ground, making the sign of the cross, mumbling something. As he comes closer, I hear what seems to be some version of last rites, Is he a priest or just some loony guy who thinks he's a priest? He manages to get to us. He pulls his black coat tighter around him in the sweltering heat and begins muttering under his breath, leaning over my husband lying so still on the ground. He makes the sign of the cross. Wait, I don't know if Bartley would want this. Get away from him, I say sharply. The man looks at me with milky blue cataract eyes. It's like a surreal scene out of a Fellini film. But he's dying he says simply. No, he isn't. He's Jewish. Not that that makes any sense. Leave us alone. A beat. The man in the black coat moves on. I hear the sound of sirens. The ambulances and fire trucks are arriving on the scene. The only trouble is they can't get the vehicles through the market. It's too crowded. They're going to set up triage. It feels like an eternity before the team of paramedics reaches us. They do a quick check of Bartley. They put a yellow tag on him. They start to move on. Wait, aren't they going to take him? This is just preliminary, I'm told. All the rescue services haven't arrived yet. They're using triage to treat the wounded. They'll be moving the injured in order of severity. They take the young Asian woman lying next to Bartley on the ground. She seems fine, no visible injuries. Take my husband, I'm yelling at them. He has blood coming out of his ears. Even I know that's a bad sign. They come back and take a closer look. They get out their phones. It seems like forever. Then, whirring sound of a helicopter above. The helicopter hovers for a beat, then drops straight down, landing in the middle of the street. Two paramedics jump out, the helicopter's propeller still whirling in the background. The paramedics attach an IV and a BP cuff to the man lying on a gurney and rush toward the helicopter. His wife follows close behind. The paramedic stops here. Wife. He's my husband. I need to go with him. Paramedic. It's not allowed. Wife. Please. What if he... Paramedic shakes his head. Sorry. We've got another victim in the chopper. Wife. Where are you taking him? Paramedic. We're medevacking him to harbor UCLA Torrance. They're the best in the West for TBI. Wife. TBI? What? But they're already loading the gurney into the helicopter. The door slams shut. I watch. We all watch, silent, as the helicopter lifts straight up off the ground and disappears into the cloudless sky. 